Um, you might notice that we don't have a moderator for this panel, and that was the point of the session. We wanted the closing session to be a session just of three activists sharing their experiences, what does it mean for them personally, and reflecting on all the topics that we had today. So I really hope you stick around and enjoy the last session with the three wonderful people who are going to be talking about what it is that moves them as an activist. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Is this on? Yeah. So we'll just go around and introduce ourselves in a very free format. So I'll ask Borka to go first. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I just want to address the ladies which are gone and to say I'm sorry that we interrupted this uh, previous yeah. discussion. <laughs> and I just want to say something very cons con to console them. You will be the bitch, you will be the prostitute, you will be the, uh, the, the travesty, you will be lesbian, you will be communist, you will be whatever is the worst in this moment if you are against them. If you agree with them, then you can be a Jew, a communist, whatever you want, but you have to be agree with your regime. And this is all. So from Thailand, I just want to say, that the uh, uh, way is uh, very long, and that's what something we had in Yugos former Yugoslavia, that's called beaches, or that's called vi uh, um, witches. And the history of the witches in Europe is something very amazing. Probably it's in Thailand also. And these are the witches, that there's some women which should be burned. And all we know that are we Protestant Catholic of who we are, or communists. That because you are witches, you will be in fire. What already has in Shakespeare plays, but I mean, it's this is for the beginning. <laughs> so I'm sorry, really, that uh, it's the subject was extremely interesting that we interrupt them. Do you want to introduce yourself all the same? Ah, need to. <laughs> I have to say something. My name is Borka Pavicevic. I was born 47 in former Yugoslavia, and I want to comment, and I'm dramaturg. And uh, I have been the dramaturgs in Yugoslav theaters. And uh, then with Thierry Sata from the Center for Culture Decontamination, at the beginning of the war, we formed the Center for Culture Decontamination. This is not because of activism. This is because of rebellion. And this is because of uh, a reaction. And this is something about the resistance. So the term activism is for me a political term and it is resistant. At my time, because I'm from 68, that's called political engagement. And it is same, like you should say for Jean-Paul Sartre, that he is activist and he was an activist. Second, we are sitting in front of the Bertolt Brecht Theater. Was a Bertolt Brecht activist? Who was Bertolt Brecht next to whom we are sitting? He was a theater person, he was an author, and yes, he has certain engagement, and that's what's called activism. So I want just to say that this term, I understand, Barbara reminds me on that, that it is actually, there is too many passivism in contemporary world, that we choose a word activism. This is a reaction on entropy, of uh, uh, getting rid of rebellion, of a life, and therefore we call it on this conference activism. Opposite of that is pessimism. Like opposite of avant-garde theater is arrière-garde theater. So this is also the construct about which we are talking. And I will finish just with the two, two, just to connect and then finish. Uh, 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 concerning the everything we have heard today, I have a few questions. Is Assange a hero or the guy who is in the prison and he is tortured? Is the heroism an engagement that what this soldier has done to give him his document or he is a hero who printed? Uh, is that whole uh, the, the subject of this conference, is that actually the question of the, the discussion about democracy 
Is that a question about capitalism, about liberal society? Is it a question about the platform after the fail of the Berlin Wall, about which we are talking, uh, and in which uh, sense we expect from us engagement, and in which co co mobilization relations stay in the context, the question of I I internet. So let me formulate that question as uh, uh, criticizing to two words, which I'm hearing today, is proactive. What does it mean, proactive? <laughs> does it mean that we are not active? Each time when somebody said we should be proactive, I know that he is not active. And the second, second term is synergia. Is that energy exist or nah? no? And we, if you say synergy, then you want to put a little sex more than which actually don't exist. And this is, uh, and that somebody used this morning, a word, uh, crowd. Crowd? <laughs> crowd? And then I will quote a Carl Sandberg song from the beginning of century, we are the mass, the people and the mob, and this is the crowd, and that has to do something with internet. If you don't want it, it will be the class phenomenon for the people which are educated to use it. Thank you. How to follow from this because it is I'm not so good in with words <laughs> like you are, so I should say something on my uh, biography. I'm from a small village in Bavaria, in the south of uh, Germany. My class background is that of a working class mixture in a village. So I was raised of being nice and being married soon. I looked forward to actually, but then everything, um, I like that. I, then I went to uh, Munich because at uh, that time we had a social democratic party who, who had a special focus on education for working class girls with a Catholic background. This is what we have nowadays. We say the, the boys with migrants in bigger inner cities are the further away, furthest away from education. And when I was uh, in school, it was my class. So I benefited from this and I came to Munich and there I um, completely changed my life. I think I joined, joined uh, as a student a feminist uh, group, women's rights group, and I just enjoyed it so much. Um, continuing to being nice but asking questions and I, I like this very much and I think that had the biggest impact on me. So um, there, what did I do? I studied and I joined, um, and my political thinking, I would say, I would not uh, say that's my activism, at being exposed in a city to different radical groups. In Germany, we have a lot of radical groups. We, we are trained, at least my age group or older, to have a very dogmatic analysis of what is the right line. So, <laughs> and uh, as there are many, you have also many groups. Uh, and I think uh, I was very impressed uh, in this, when I was in, um, Munich uh, to being exposed to people from the global south. Like I uh, did exposures uh, to the Philippines, I stayed with prostitutes on a US military base and I was thinking they are discussing how to overcome and to fight US imperialism because this is what made me tick. Not that I, I felt strong that I could fight it, but in my analysis this was a strong layer of oppression. And when I was there staying with them for a week and their dreams were just uh, having an ordinary life, uh, I, I learned a lot. And at that time in the Philippines it was the strongest moving, uh, growing uh, guerrilla movement with a lot of uh, popular groups like farmers, peasants, women and I was very impressed so I projected my being a, a progressive person into another continent even and to learn from there. Now I, then I took a job uh, for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in Geneva so at the, in the 90s. At that time the Soviet Union was yeah, dissolved, collapsing and um, my activism there was on the one side learning how the United Nations is working 
with all the right words and I think the right analysis, but without any life. And um, at that time, I was, uh, it was great to be exposed to people from internationally, women, and not knowing what the world will be after the bipolar world. It was very fascinating. Mm. Uh, but I also uh, learned of being an activist, uh, dealing with a huge bureaucracy. You have to have completely different skills than organizing your small anti-imperialist women's rights group in a Bavarian city. Uh, if, because still the aim is that you reach something, you know, and so that's one. And then the last step, or maybe it's short, then after seven years I decided I wanted to live back in my country because also I wanted to use the language and the politics and, uh, and I applied to become uh, Secretary General of Amnesty International. Also being driven of doing human rights work. And that was also a uh, um, big, I, I got the job, I was very surprised because I didn't know anybody in this organization, I just applied on a, a paper advertisement. So, and I was just in charge of a, a, a a company, I would say. I had a trade union, I was in charge of the salary, I was in charge of the fundraising plan. And Amnesty International is a kind of a big influential organization. So I had also to learn how to speak, for example. If I would have addressed and saying, of course at that time anti-imperialism was not a vogue at all <laughs> in the 90s, but I, have to le I had to use uh, and learn a different language to address the media to reach perhaps the same thing um, before. Yes, um, and maybe we can t talk more about this. Uh, and uh, yes, now um, after 10 years of being head of Amnesty, I decided to, um, not to switch sides, uh, but uh, to uh, run for a political mandate and now I'm in the European Parliament. And very closely I work together with activists, sometimes individuals, human rights defenders or organized in non-governmental organizations who try to do their work. And I think it helps a lot to be have been an activist uh, to understand the dynamics. But as I said, my form of activism was very different. And, the differ and, and you look back to a lifetime also, the, it, uh, the, the places change where you live. Um. <laughs> so as you can tell, we're going for very unconventional introductions. Um, so I'm Nanjira from Nairobi, Kenya. And wow, these guys are a tough act to follow, but I'll try have something that sounds wow. <laughs> so um, I was born in the late 80s in Nairobi, Kenya. And growing up in the 90s against a political background where um, political participation was subversion to the regime that was. And so people could not speak against the regime without either ending up in being tortured or um, one famous movement that was really young, but I'll never forget was women freedom uh, women who went and camped outside a, what was a torture chamber in the middle of a city for about three months waiting for their sins to be released because they had been speaking against the oppression that was at the time and so i grew up against that background and also against the background of being told you know as a young girl you can be anything you want to be and so enter the 2000s you go to school you you know go through the system and in the process of becoming who I was told I can be one day I woke up and I was told I'm an activist and so yeah so I was like and this is because largely due to digital um, spheres digital media so you know like everyone else Facebook Twitter having conversations and then people start saying are you an activist and I'm like no I'm just having conversations or asking questions and it just ties to exactly what Borka was saying is it that the society has become so passive that anyone who speaks in what should be ordinary, asking the fundamental questions, then is an activist. And so I sort of had to ease into it. And it's not a, it's not a title I have anything against, it's just the question, again, um, is society that passive? And in my context, growing up, you know, in Africa, the land of disease and poverty. And <laughs> so against that backdrop, are people so tired of or desensitized to the issues that are, has a fight? plateaued that anyone else who speaks just a bit above it is an activist and so um, just to sort of keep the ball uh, rolling now is how it then affects my personal life is I've had to ease into that title now so if, if, you, if you insist on calling me that I won't fight you like it's cool 
I'll, I'll keep doing my thing. I'll be told I'm a feminist. I'm like, hey, okay, fine. Let's go with it. Let's work with what you want to, the frame you want to give me. But how do we then, it's always been a, a question of, in my everyday life, I am a musician. I am a mathematician as well. So I refused to take the role that was told you have to either do the arts or the sciences. It's something we have a big problem in our education system. And I told everyone, I'm going to do both. And they're like, ha, 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 ha. and I did it. And then in every aspect of it, I was told, you're an activist. So I'm like, wow, how many titles can a girl have? <laughs> and so um, I found that you know, in every facet of what I do, how I speak, who I speak to, um, it's something that I carry every day. And so how it's affected my personal life is not because I've had to ease into anything. I've just grown accustomed to what people look at it to be. And, um, you know, talking to this amazing ladies before here, we we're just trying to understand how does that whole culture of activism, uh, activism uh, personally affect your life? So I'll just set it back to Borka and she can keep us going and then we'll come back this way and keep circulating. <laughs> I will try to answer some of those questions which are put here. You can see them in the program, what Christian probably wrote it down. But to, when you... Uh, you Geraldina. Geraldina. You know, when you formulate this like this, it, uh, it's a strong dramaturgically problem. You are in situation to say something nice about yourself. And this is very tricky. tricky. I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, because when somebody is asking you how does a lifetime of activism change a person, that means I feel myself like some person who was changed, you know. I mean, this is very... How <laughs> to say you... I, I, I admire very much this, but I mean, and then the second question, how the, uh, what impact does your political engagement have on your personal life? <laughs> you know, so it means first I have a personal life, what is not true, <laughs> because I have no the personal life, and then this activism in my personal life, you know, I, I don't understand it in that way. So thank you very much for this. <laughs> For these compliments, but really, you know, I just can't say anything about me so gorgeous. I want to say just one thing, that I was in the life in the communication with the, uh, what is a little bit different than the another uh, theater people, uh, which actually the people from culture, let's say that. Uh, it's a really, sometimes very alienated group, sometimes, sometimes. And actually the people don't know the human rights issues. And I was in family circumstances, I knew how the jail looked. I know who is missing. I know that's what was in the war. So I just don't want to excuse anybody. The violence was something very present in the in, um, area I'm living. The violence is in general present. And some of us has been, um, I became an activist when I saw the concentration camp in, when I was young. And I will never forget that. And uh, that was the cause that you are, th trying, that you are thinking about the politic, about the human, uh, relations about possibility and somehow when you're a child you don't know that but during the dream you say maybe I should do something that such a things will never happen again I don't know how it's happened but it's happened you know so I think that today what we have to do is to see what is the right wing in the Europe we are living and what we can do so what is this question together with the internet and this, uh, this uh, Facebooks and all of that, we can be maybe sensitive what is going on, how that may rise, what the Bertolt Brecht had said about the small street performances. This is uh, uh, a reason why um, why well, that is what is called engagement, because this is the usual word is uh, political engagement. Then we were living in the situation in which I think that it is not decent not to be politically engaged. It's not decent, it's unhuman, it's just immoral. <laughs> Thank you, and this is the cause of why you 
you just can't look at that. This morning, I was listening to this beautiful singing. How you will relax. I can't relax. I don't know that. Because when I stand up in the morning together with the center satsanos, I don't relax. I am just running out of the bed, dressed something, try to be clean. The phones are ringing in the meantime, and you go and work. And this is all about the birds singing. It's in my literature apart. I'm a columnist, you know. Then the birds are singing when I'm writing something, but not in the real life. You know, so this is the difference between old age and a new age. <laughs> so we are, I'm not relaxed and I will not be relaxed. <laughs> and when those uh, managers are coming with some called a retreat, can you imagine you're living in the Belgrade in the middle of the blood, mud and shit and you will go to be retreated in non-governmental organizations. And what is that kitsch? The second, violence. The second, first. The second is kitsch. And this is the causes for what you are doing, something what the people call that it is activity. And it is just a normal defense. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to explain what the kitsch is. Should I? Please. A kitsch is a production of the human alienating being. You first have to have a kitsch as a human being. And then this kitsch is produced in kitsch media, uh, uh, f fashion, the, all this uh, uh, rotten, the kitsch is something uh, which is most of that is about the dead and about erotic. These are the two cases in which kitsch is more obvious. Kitsch is to live in the country when the road is totally rotten, but you are driving a Mercedes and the Jeep over this hole. The kitsch are that when you have no trotter and everything is absolutely disaster. The ladies are walking on the high hills like this. And then in the afternoon, they are going to make the plastic operations because everybody look, will look in the new age style on the television and you are living in the country in which is one million unemployed people, you have one pensioner on one employed person, you have 8,100 people which come from the war, and that's called transition. This transition and entering the Western Europe, I'm adapting my Gino Dorfles, or the or theoretic of history of kitsch, this ki uh, Europe is entering through Armani, Versace, uh, 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 malls, whatever, uh, all over around. And this is how the Europe is understood. That means kitsch, discrepancy between reality you are living and uh, 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 the situation you are imagine that it is... Uh, that you are living in. So the part of that is a kitsch of the internet. Well, <laughs> well I, um, I cannot, I will not also not follow on that. I think the second um, focus should be on how affected the personal activism my life, yeah. my personal life. Well, I would also say it was not the form of being active, it was more the su substance on what we were active. I mean, it certainly affected my personal life that when I uh, was 30, I got a chance to full-time being an activist by being Secretary General of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in Geneva. And I did not see, and I don't see it now, as this being a work which I'm paid for. This became my personal, my main life, actually. Because it didn't stop. Uh, of course, it was all the time. It was nowadays, you would say, extremely self-exploiting, even if you are in a leadership position. But it, 
I saw it as uh, in, I use, uh, by my thinking is also old fashioned, I thought it's a privilege actually that I am paid for a political involvement I would do being unpaid as well. And then I think this way of life and uh, dealing, I, I transformed into an internationalist and this uh, changed my life also how I saw my own history and being connected to Nazism. And it's not only the good side of our history that we produced Marx and so on, but also the worst of it. Um, that uh, changed my personal life. I, I, I thought of myself, I lived abroad in a completely international environment, even Geneva is in Europe, but in Geneva you don't mix with the Genevan people, you live in an international cloud. And in the 90s, it was fascinating. We, I was exposed to people, heartbreaking debates, who relatives and friends gave their life for a revolution. Not just a revolution for a little bit, but all. Yeah, Transform a military dictatorship, like in Cuba or in Nicaragua, or in the fighting moves in El Salvador. And then that and then and we saw what all failed and now we from a german background european background was state socialism all wrong or where did it go wrong if the intention was uh, right and i would say that was kind of you know, maybe activism but uh, this was a very um, strong i think and so i think over a life uh, span um, always how the political i mean my activism was anti-war women's rights and now it's uh, human rights in the broader sense. So it changes when the different political climate or the big political lines changes. And when I look now or uh, after the world conferences where we thought there will be more uh, thinking and more honesty in, in relations, you know, after the ideological uh, times is over, there was a lot of hope in the 90s and now I think it was completely, uh, is, there's no, not this kind of hope I see in the activism. Even people um, fight a lot, but uh, even human rights defenders, they fight the oppression in their country. Mm -hmm. they, they have also perhaps other ideas, but uh, it's not so much or I'm not so much exposed to activists who discuss how society should be. It's a general acceptance that it is like it is, and we have to change it a little bit to the better. It's in a positive in a sense, it's less ideologically driven. So for me, I find now in this period of my life, it's a good um, lines to look at the basic human rights. So can, live, can the people live without fear? Can they live without poverty? That's the two uh, measurements for me. If I judge a government or a political group, are they in favor changing society to this or not? So it's less act, uh, act, um, ideologically, I uh, um, repeat myself, but I think I learned from listening to younger people being very political that they perhaps um, have different forms of activism using the internet, but it doesn't make them less political like we were, where we spent nights in debating the right lines or something, which also at the result was not so big change than if you just communicate in the internet. Um, so we've sort of moved into discussing methods and forms of expression of activism over time. and. It's it's quite interesting, like in my in my understanding and in my background setting, where you find so society is so s passive or desensitized to the issues, you know, um, growing up against a backdrop of knowing that, you know, your continent or your country is perceived to always be in war or in poverty or so you're always fighting perceptions and you find people are so desensitized. And so expressions of activism have also had, it feels like you've gone a step back. Now you have to go and indulge in that passive way and start, you know, well, from that level of understanding or comfort that people, or quiche, as she said, of people have created for themselves. How do you then start poking and prodding for people to start thinking different? So it's, I found that it's um, applying what design thinking into understanding the situation that most people are in, you know, especially in mental thinking. Um, so people are tired. I can tell you this about Africa right now, and I can speak of Africa as a continent in general. People are tired of hearing. We're tired of hearing that we have poverty. Yeah, we know. Um, yeah, I mean, we know. We know. We know. Thanks. Like, thank you very much. But we know. 
uh, poverty, war, we, we understand, yes, these problems are there. But here we are in the context of a globalized world, largely powered by the internet, where people are also looking at other forms of expression, other forms of self-actualization against that backdrop. And so it's, it's, a very, it's a very dynamic sort of situation where you have people who want to dream like everyone else about conquering the world or doing great things, but you're always being bogged down. And so people are largely desensitized and you find that or I've found that you have to then go to that level sometimes. And it's, um, it's a bit unfortunate. You'd, you'd hope would be in a better situation, but we're, we're working with all these dynamics. And I have to really say that, you know, to our credit, we are very resilient people. And so um, you find that the forms of act, uh, expressions of activism, uh, activism are not like telling people, let's go on the street and protest till the pothole is fixed. No, it's not that, and no one is gonna show up. So um, it's more like, how do you get people to change their thinking? Because people are desensitized and are in a sort of like uh, self-preservation mode. I just wanna live my life. I don't wanna think about the pothole. I just wanna drive that big, nice Mercedes I saw in the latest ad. Um, and so it's true. <laughs> it's a, something we've been told in, in a lot of African countries about um, apathy within the middle class. Middle class being defined as these people who are on the internet now and then, you know, they're aware of what happens or lifestyles in other parts of the world. And so you find people are being accused of something. They're coming from a backdrop of, we've grown up being told poverty, 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 war, 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 corruption, corruption, corruption. You know, the, there's a, some, the phrase called the four horsemen of the African apocalypse. That's poverty, war, corruption, and disease. And so against that backdrop, people are trying to build better lives for themselves. Uh, but as they do that, they're also being bogged down and made to feel sorry for the fact that they want better lives. So you can imagine trying to get people into action in such a situation is not just, let's go to the street, or it's not absolute. It's very subjective. It's very... And so I, understand, I, I agree completely with Borja. It then becomes, you cannot separate it from your life. It's something you do every day in every kind of conversation. Even when you're having drinks at the bar, you have to, you know, have it as part of that conversation. And so um, that's, I would say, for me at least, as a young African woman, that's how activism in my continent and my country, and even bringing it as an exportation to the rest of the world, that's how we're coming from it. Yeah. Let me just uh, um, say some experience with the culturalization of the politic. I talk with us of this. We had this, um, um, when you ask uh, how the people are not on the street and they are on the internet. I mean, when you uh, said him uh, the whole morning we are talking about that we are going to do something. What is this something? <laughs> and then it comes the word a sort of. <laughs> when I hear the sort of, this English, sort of. I immediately know that there is no a content, you know, because this is actually the consequence of that. Uh, we had many demonstrations in Belgrade, and I will not bother you, 97. And then it became that it should not be politically. It should be that it has to be culturally. So it will not be dangerous anymore. And so it comes, the culturalization of the public spectacle. And actually, this is a question of the public space, internet or a real life. How you can use it, is that a tool? No, it's not a tool. For my opinion, it's a world. We are sitting now in a Gutenberg country. Once has been changed everything. Now is changed everything, and partly and probably the part of this crisis all over the world is this changing, that you have to clarify the classes, the races, the everything through this computer, and this is a political question also. I just want to say this small experience about this culturalization of the public space. So it was not boring, it was not ideological, it was not dangerous, it was not serious. They really did, don't think that they are just performing on the streets. Fine, isn't it? And I will quote one moment when Slavoj Žižek said on interpretation of the hair, Radoragni, um, musical, he said, now the world of fight for freedom is stopped. And we gave the, to the world the, another input. That means a joy. Enjoy yourself. 
And from the moment that enjoying was installating in the public space, you start to lose it like a place for part of the for the freedom. And that's something it has to do with that. Uh, uh, um, that's what they have. And I just want to say to both of you that we may be draw something extremely for me um, nice. And this is that the activism is coming for the fight against the, um, the violence. You mentioned fear and you mentioned poverty and ideological terror. And I think it's just a nice that it's are those true crucial apocalypse <laughs> fight that we are actually against this st riders of the apocalypse. Isn't it just you quoted that and as a dramaturg I write it down. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I think you said it. Uh, what more to say? I mean, uh, it, is, it fits each culture, each background, personal stories, groups, fight how to overcome fear, fight violence and uh, poverty. And But I maybe as you related to the internet, I think we should also use uh, the or see it as an instrument for winning this fight. And uh, if I compare, for example, now, if uh, you want to have influence on an international conference on women's rights or what have you not, like uh, see uh, the conference now in New York on violence against women. With the internet, if you are able to uh, have it and you uh, can use it, so you can equip yourself if you live in the periphery somewhere, not necessarily in New York or Geneva or where else, you come fully with the same knowledge as a European to a conference. You have learned over the internet how to lobby. So I think it gives us, regardless where we live, in a relatively cheap form, information, all the information we need. So that is positive. And I think, um, but uh, of course, the internet is also uh, used by those who built their power on fear, on violence, and on their greed uh, for more. They use the same internet, and uh, let's, I'm uh, from Germany, uh, also companies um, build on that, you know. Like, for example, we have a lot of companies who produce good internet quality around the world, which is essential for us to live together in a global world, but also to uh, create and install fear, like we uh, export in more than 65 countries censorship technology. See, people can spy in, in, in Bahrain was the case, uh, torture people when the person who was an activist, an activist and an intellectual from this country, uh, he he asked, why could they ask me these questions during torturing? And when he was uh, coming out, he found out that they spied in, in all the different forms. So, um, so we have to see it as a tool. We have to understand how we can use it, but we also have to see how those who are our, not enemies, but th who are not st uh, standing for the values we stand and the world we stand, how they can misuse it and expose this. And I think even if I look now uh, what, for example, the organization Frontline is doing, uh, they train the human rights defenders or activists in the world. Again, um, on the second round of, um, how can I say, development of the internet, how they can protect them from spying in. I mean, it's a enormous, so it influences the way of activism, but it should not, I, I personally also first, I thought I didn't want to learn it um, <laughs> uh, in, when I was in Geneva, but uh, it would be also um, okay, not unfair perhaps if we downplay the role of the internet for international solidarity, because it, it helps enormously. Um, and so that just before we open it to them, I'd also make the case as someone who's been dubbed an activist because of that space that it's, it helps especially with informing and especially in places where people have been misinformed. And I can say this about Africa especially. We are unlearning things that we've been told because um, freedom of expression and all the 
you know, information is now starting to come to the surface. And so it's starting to help with the situation of passivism, as you put it, where people have been so passive, but it's because the narrative has always been one way. You've always been told you're the bottom of the food chain, you know, um, you're not being told about how life was before, say, colonialism, for instance, in Africa. And so now this information is starting to come on the space, even just as either comedy, satire, anything, whatever forms they're coming in, information is starting to stream in. And so we're starting to see people move from passivism to that point of, activism, hopefully. And I think in that conclusion, we'll at least open it up to the floor for questions, comments, so that, you know, I think us guys have stuck to time. Yay! <laughs> yes, you have to. Yes, it is. Thank you. Yeah, this is me trying to take my, my stolen 10 minutes, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, anyway, I just wanted to tell uh, Nanjira, also as you know, as a you know, black African woman who, and often when people when people call you an activist, it's, it's mudslinging. People are, don't mean it nicely. When someone says, oh my God, you're a feminist, it's not, it's not in a nice way. It's like, oh my God, you have herpes. It's, it's, it, it's not meant in a, yeah, and, and people often throw these labels at you, these labels at you, and um, when, when I finally realized that feminism isn't what I do, it's who I am, that was amazing. It stops becoming an effort. It stops becoming something that you feel you have to defend. It stops becoming something that you feel you have to um, explain, you have to justify. It's just who you are. Just like, you know, I'm five foot two, I can't change that. I'm a feminist, I can't change that, and I don't want to. And it's, it's, it's inspiring to know that across the continent that I guess the struggles are the same, but also the passion is the same. Um, and that a lot of young women, not just in Africa, but all over the world, we, you, we've, we, we have had it. And something that we keep, you know, praying to the, to the gods and the goddesses and the, the angels and the, you know, those mythical beings at the office is that we have a women's spring one day where women really just say, we really, really, we're sick and tired of this, we, we want, that we want change and we want it now. And we stop being passive in our demands. We stop being too nice. And this is something that um, the organization I work for and I myself say, why, why do you have to be angry? I say, because you don't hear me unless I force myself into your space. You don't see me unless I force myself into your space. And I can't be nice until you acknowledge my presence. And um, women need to stop being nice about things. There's no nice way to make change any kind of change is going to be painful no matter how nice you try to be about it. And so thank you so much and it's been wonderful. So, so wonderful. All those people should have stuck around, I think. Anyway. I will try in English. I hope you can understand me. Uh, the point is, uh, I enjoy it a lot, a lot today in the workshop. Uh, I learned a lot also. The only thing is, I miss uh, to hear some people from Latin America, because in here in Europe and other places, rich countries somehow, uh, we are talking about to occupy the, the public space. But somehow, in some countries in there, they are occupying the power. They are doing some revolutions somehow in their, their own way. And it will be interesting to have a place for them in here. And to the other side is, uh, I, can, I could hear today a lot of people, some of them more independent, some of, some of them more in, involved in the professionalism of activism or solidarity. Uh, but the new thing in Europe for after a, a lot of years is that the normal people my mother, for example, that always were, uh, was going to the church every Sunday, now is telling me, hey, they are, they, we have to, to kill all them, they are bastards. They, she's going to, I mean, to, uh, uh, to politicians. politicians. Yeah, because uh, people now understood, sorry, I repeat, uh, in Europe we are uh, living something new after a lot of years, and it is uh, normal people are 
became an activist. Not the professional ones, the ones who has website, media, uh, support from governments, foundation, but normal people like my mother who was all the time in the church praying and it was her way of demanding something and now it's going to the street and saying hey, we had to kill all, all them. I mean, it's metaphoric. I mean, uh, there is something new, there is a democra uh, democracy from the buses in Europe now, in, in the south of Europe, in Italy, Portugal, Greece, and other countries, and I haven't heard any voice of them in here today, and I, I'm also quite of wonder. And the only question that I would like to, to ask to, to Barbara is, uh, from, from this point of view, for example, for, because of your history, uh, how do you feel? I mean, you had a, a history of uh, personal activism, and now you are in other place. You are in the place of the power. Um, if you go to Spain, to Greece, or Syntagma Place, or Plaza del Sol, a lot of people could, could then tell you, call you an activist. They will say, somehow you are on the other side. So I will, it's, it's a friendly critique. Ne? I mean, how do you feel it? How, how do you re will react to that? Because do you feel you are with the activist, or do you feel you, are, you went to the other side somehow? Thanks. Great possibility, maybe, for the last word for Barbara, if you like. Go. Well, um, I feel good. I have to say I have not regretted to uh, run for a mandate for the European Parliament. My aim was to see where there is space. I am chair of the Human Rights Committee. Where is a space where we can do more or more intensively human rights work. And I still see this space. It's not much, but I can see this. I also would say, um, and I don't feel uh, as an activist, I have to say, but I feel in a, in a kind of a movement where also politicians can be part of, because it seems for what they stand for. And uh, being uh, in uh, the Green Party, uh, in the European Parliament, uh, I don't think we are necessarily in the place of the power, uh, I have to say. Uh, still, we don't, nearly don't get a majority of very essential things we want to have. Uh, so that's also a differentiation. And I, uh, I wonder, my, not, I, I, do, I understand why people say this, let the kill the politicians, or if you look to opinion polls in Germany, politicians are ranking lowest. Police has a high ranking, so, well, okay. But let's say uh, the, uh, they rank lowest, because I think we are in this economic mess, because the politic, politics uh, uh, withdrew from this space. We let the banking sector go, the financial capital go, and so now we are in the fight, actually, we, we, we may not win this, that the state and the, the elected representative of the people, in the classical sense, should organize society in favor of the people. So we need more politicians to get more space and more power and take it away for them who, who uh, created the chaos, not individual people, but also structures. And um, I, we have colleagues from Greece, from Portugal, from Spain, when we discuss with them, if they, we have time to discuss with the root causes, I feel confident. Of course, uh, if I'm just there in a demonstration and they say down with Germany, I don't feel good, but I also, it's, uh, you know, I'm more uh, I, I thinking, I understand the anger of the people, but I think behind this anger, if we start talking, we may find uh, ways that also they change their political system a little bit, or Europe altogether, so it's more to a benefit. And I would also not prioritize uh, what is uh, better to be, because uh, Activists are not like activists, as you know. <laughs> so uh, we have a, a, activists and non-governmental organizations amongst themselves also have weaknesses. They have to be addressed. And people change over a lifespan and organizations change over a lifespan. So it's always time for reflection. And I would not say that there in 
uh, in my understanding of how societies uh, can operate, that there is no space for politicians. As a politician, it's already a bad word, I think. Uh, in French, I, in, I take French classes. They say, don't say you are a politician. You have to say you are a deputy. <laughs> because it is kind of completely rotten, corrupt, and what have you not. But we are not having a monopoly of this. Because everywhere where you have structures, people, uh, their greed for power can corrupt each of us, regardless of you are a party politician or a head of a non governmental organization. I think that this, uh, this coming back of uh, um, the role of the politician, that's something that should be done. I mean, the p politic is rotten and destroyed like many words, like many acts. And actually, maybe the Greece is dying, but the term politician and politic should not be spoiled from one or from the another side. It can be... Uh, uh, human uh, position in a sense, and there were many of those people which made this world look like this and progreed, and they have been also the people from politic. So this kind of a, engagement in the meantime is lost, but but it, as it is, it's one um, human uh, uh, activity which is uh, uh, more than. Uh, uh, public and more than ethic. It can be ethic. Yeah. Where actually is lost ethic from the politic? Where actually the, the, this world goes in this direction? So I, I think that uh, that's what you, your French said, that she is not right. You should not escape. I wish you that you become an example of the politician which can lead and say something truthful. I really hope in that, isn't it? I think I'll just add on to that and say, I think activism, politis, politics, politicians, all the words, the power lies in the actions that are beneath them. And it needs to go back to that. And we need to stop separating the two and looking at active, you know, activism or anything else as a term first and look at it as what actions back it up. And it's taking it back to the actions. And with actions do come words, but you know, the fulfillment of these actions, I think, is a future of activism, polit you know, collectivism, every other ism and ish, you know, profession that is evolved around this. So it's back to the actions, or like Borka and say, and I say, the way of life. So thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you to the three of you. I was fascinated listening from the front row. And uh, I think for me personally, this was the absolute highlight of the day. I'd like to just uh, to close this uh, pick up on uh, Borka, you rightly pointed out some of these questions I wrote down only make sense in certain contexts. And I, I want to quote my sister. She's also a musician. And she gave an interview recently. And uh, she was asked, so what kind of hobbies do you have? And she just replied in one sentence saying, hobbies are for people that don't have passion for their work. And I'm saying this. I'm not insulting people. I think it's great if you have time for hobbies. But I think you show today that you, know, you are definitely three people who have a lot of passion for the work that you have. And and we've had a lot of people share that today. So for me, it was very exciting to be in a room with so much passion and so much action. And yeah, I want to thank you all for, for being here and saying things. <laughs>